doing a physics for all talk at the APS March meeting this year that Felix Werner came to. Uh, and he thought it would be a good idea for me to give the same talk here. So that's what I'm doing, okay, in a slightly longer version. Uh, so did you all go to my physics of, yes, okay. So sorry if you did that, but that, that's, that's why there's this additional colloquium that wasn't necessarily planned. And the physics for all this year was about COVID. So unfortunately, this will be a COVID talk because that's what he saw and that's what he wanted. So I've, as you see, I feel I should excuse myself for why I'm going to talk about what I'm talking about. But this is generally, I, so I'm going to try to sort of give a little bit more of an overview. This is work we've been doing with Thierry Mora, who's also at the department for a large number of years now. And as you can see, with a lot of our collaborators here and uh, an experimental group that uh, uh, brought. Okay, so given that it's late in the day and everybody's pretty tired, so I'm gonna start with uh, who done it. So imagine your life pre-COVID, looking at you, most of you had a life pre-COVID, so that's good. You would go to scientific meetings in remote locations. There would be excited scientists and amazing party later. And imagine that the next day Joe is found dead. And next to Joe's body, there are a few drops of blood that don't belong to Joe. So this being scientists, they cry genetic tests for everyone. And genetic tests reveal that the murderer is one of two twins, Alex or Terry. Now, genetic test tests your DNA and identical twins have exactly the same DNA. Okay, I, oh, I'm supposed to take my mask off also. Um, so they have exactly the same DNA, so you can't distinguish who the murderer is, which of the, of the twins is the murderer just based on genetic tests. So in they call Detective Asia Bear, who has more modern techniques at her disposal. And so what Asia will use is she'll use the immune system to figure out who the murderer is. So what is the immune system? Well, again, here we are this year after, you know, the last two or three years, we're all experts in the immune system. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about the adaptive immune system and specifically its T cell branch. So T cells are special cells that have the ability through binding to the receptor, to the molecular receptor, to r discriminate a foreign molecule from a molecule that's natural to your body. So they just bind different molecules all the time and they're able to perform this discrimination tasks and saying this is fine, this is natural to your body, and this is not fine, meaning you should initiate an immune response and kill it. And what happens when they do that? Well, when they recognize uh, a pathogen, they proliferate. They make many copies of themselves and this helps them target the, uh, the, 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 the pathogen more quickly simply because there's more of them. So they make what's called the clone and then the clone gangs up and kills the pathogen. Uh, if they don't recognize anything, after some time they die. So if we now look into this immune system through technologies such as sequencing, which basically means you go in, you get a blood test, they sort out the T cells from your blood, and then they sequence them. That means they read the, pro the, the DNA structure that encodes for this receptor proteins. So they just basically read how you make these different receptors. You get these many different types of receptors. What you're reading there is you're reading the infection history of what this person ever encountered. You're basically in that diversity of the different cells, you have the history of all the times that this proliferation event happened and how big it was and so on and so on, in principle, okay? The only problem is we don't know how to read it. So we have access to this information, we can do the experiment, but then we get lists and we don't know how to interpret them. 
So that's what I mean by we have a personalized medical record. If I could take your blood now, you couldn't tell me, oh, no, no, I never had this disease, that never happened to me. I would know better because your blood doesn't lie if I knew how to read it. And so that's what I'm interested in doing in learning how to read this record. And why am I interested in doing that as a statistical physicist? Well, because it is a statistical system. The way this functions, it, it functions in a statistical way, meaning that so this each cell has many receptors, but they're all of the same kind. So to protect us against different pathogens, we need many different cells with many different receptors. The way of getting many different receptors, the only way is to have many different cells. And that's where we get a statistical ensemble of different cells, we get a diverse ensemble. And when they proliferate, their frequencies change and so on and so on. So we have this working self-generated, uh, which we'll get to, self-kept, distributed system of recognition. So the question is, how does it work and how can we read it? Okay, so, but first of all, let's see how it helps us find the murderer. So what we're going to do is we're gonna compare these drops of blood found by Joe with blood coming from the t each of the two, two twins, each of the twins, so in general, if any two people. And I'm going to show you that the number of shared sequences receptor sequences, I'll just count how many receptor sequences the two samples share, and only thanks to that, I'll be able to figure out whether this drop of blood and the sample come from the same person or whether they come from different people. So this is what it looks like. This is the number of shared sequences uh, in blue. In blue is coming from when the two samples come from the same person, and here in pink, uh, sorry, in orange is when the two samples come from two different people, and in pink when they come from twins. So two people, but with generally the same DNA. So you can see that twins, identical twins, look exactly the same as you and I would do in this test, as any two different people. Whereas if the sample comes from the same person, uh, they, they look, you share many more sequences. And this the signature of how many sequences you share is stable over time. So this is in days, but we've shown by models that I'll show you later that we can extrapolate it even over years. So even 40 years later, we could say that the murderer was Alex, because who else could I have to be the murderer in this talk? Uh, and so we, we have a way of figuring this out. So this being scientists, of course, they're gonna ask, well, but how does it work? Why do samples coming from the same person share more in common than coming from two different people? So first of all, so I need to dwell more into the immune system here. And so the first thing I wanna tell you is that we have 10 to the ninth, when I said we need the diverse ensemble of different receptors, we actually have, when that by, by diverse and big, I mean diverse and big, so we have 10 to the ninth uh, different receptors in each of us, at least, okay? So that's what I mean by roughly diversity. And so receptors are proteins, proteins are encoded by DNA. If you wanted to encode each of these receptor proteins in your DNA, since each of your cells has the same DNA, that's a fact from biology, uh, you would need to encode 10 to the ninth different genes. You would need to have 10 to the ninth different genes, okay, in each cell. So, so far you're fine because you don't know that you have overall all the other genes in your body, you only have 10 to the four. Okay, so this is five orders of magnitude more genes than you have otherwise for all the different genes. So that means if we want to squeeze them in there, well, so what does it mean? Right, we have 10 to the fourth genes total. Uh, nucleus in general, that's where the DNA is in the cell, is about the size of one pixel. So if we now want to squeeze these additional 10 to the fifth genes, that means our nucleus should be 30 centimeters long. So apparently, according to Google, the only thing in the world that is 30 centimeters long is a Subway sandwich. So that would be our nucleus, and that means our body would be the size of Mount Everest. So you see a scaling problem. Okay, 
So how does it work? So nature has come up with this really funky way of generating diversity, which combines combinatorics and randomness. So now you may be starting to understand why we got interested in this problem. So each of your receptors is made out of three parts. They're called V, D, and J. And you have a number of templates uh, in, your, in your body for these genes. So you have genes that are, yeah, it's fine. Uh, you, you have basically templates for each of these parts, some certain number, and in a process, a specific process, you pick one V, one D, one J, and you edit the DNA. You cut the DNA in your cells. So your immune cells actually have different DNA than all your different cells in the body, at least in this place, because you only keep one V, one D, one J. And so you can see from these numbers that if you do the combinatorics, you get to the order of a thousand different combinations. But we need to get to 10 to the ninth. So we have a few orders of magnitude to go. So what happens next is there's special molecules that randomly insert and delete uh, what are called nucleotides, which are basically letters. So this is how this, this is what comes out of the sequencing machine. That's what it looks like. So they randomly insert these letters and take them out and delete them at these junctions. Okay, so let's think about that for a second. So most of you are probably not familiar with nucleotides. So let's think about words. Imagine you take two words like biological physics and now I'm allowed to, in the middle, I'm allowed to delete and insert anything I want. So I can make biological physics into biotic aesthetics, biopic logistics, biology basics, and so on and so on. So we're doing by deleting and inserting different things. And so we're doing the molecular version of this, which is shown here. This gray sequence can be made by taking this V, and this D1, or it's exactly the same gray sequence. You can now stare at it for the rest of the talk and see whether I'm right, or you can trust me. Or you can take another V, V9 instead of V2, D2 instead of D1, and just delete and insert different things. You get the idea, right? Since I have the ability to cut and paste, I can make the same thing in many different ways. And of course, if I do that, so let me go back here. If I do that, uh, I showed you an example with, uh, that worked. I showed you a biolo the biological physics example. But the first thing I thought of actually showing you when I thought of this, I thought I'll take the word colloquium. And then there turns out that there's only one word in the English language that ends with cum, and it's colloquium. So first of all, you need the right building blocks. And second of all, half of you can imagine also taking stuff out and putting stuff in that will make nonsense words, that won't make any sense, right? And so that happens here too. And in fact, it happens in 14% of cases. When you add stuff in and delete stuff, you get sequences that are called technically out of frame, but basically will never be able to make a protein. Okay, so now remember you have two chromosomes. Everybody knows they have two chromosomes? Yes? Yes, good, okay. If you don't, you just found something out, okay? So, uh, so you first do the first chromosome. On each chromosome you have the same DNA. You do the same, you do the first one. If that works, that's great. That's gonna be a receptor, it's gonna be expressed, it's gonna work. If it doesn't work, it gets silenced and you move on to the second one. If that one also doesn't work, it dies, tough. And the cell dies in general. But if it does work, then the second one will be expressed. But the first one, if you then look into and do the sequencing, which is basically like a microscope for looking in at what DNA sequence is there, you're gonna find this fossil record of the receptor that tried to be made but failed. So that means that if we look at these failed receptors, and we do have access to them, we're going to have access into the statistics of this, uh, of this generation process, and not anything else that later happened to the cell, such as selection and so on and so on, that I 
mentioned when I talked about proliferation. Okay. So, here is where we really come in. And Okay, and so now what we want to do is we want to say what, is the, what are the statistics of this process? We want to learn something about this process. So we have these failed receptors to do something about it, uh, but how are we going to do that? So the name of the game is what's the probability with which each of these receptors is made in you? So now we could also play a game. You could take out a piece of paper and write down say 60, 80 CGs in whatever order you want, and you can give it to me, and I can tell you what's the probability that this is a T cell receptor that's made in you, okay? I'm very confident here, I know I can do this. So how can I do this? Well, how would I do this? How would I estimate the probability that uh, I, I, it, we make a given receptor? So the first thing is I take these sequences and I try to find the most likely V, D, and J that made it. And as I showed you on the example with words and on the previous slide, there's many different ways I can make each sequence. So instead of taking one sequence, I, can, I, I, I can't do that. I can't figure out exactly what, which genes made the sequence. However, I can make a library of possible scenarios by which I mean choice of V, D, and J that made this given sequence, right? Just as I showed you on the previous slide, I'm a bit afraid of show, moving anything, but uh, I showed you two scenarios here, but I can, you can see that I can easily find more and more, just like I did with the words. So I make a list of all the scenarios, so choices of all these processes that are consistent with a given sequence, and then I assign weights to them. And then I sum over all, the all these weights and all the sequences to calculate the mean probability of using a given V gene, of having a given number of insertions, deletions, and so on and so on. And then I have a model, which is the most general factorizable model, and I, used, I plug these into this model and recalculate these weights. And I do this self-consistently until it converges. And then I have the elements of my model, which are the probability of using the V genes, D genes, and so on and so on. Okay, so either, either you get, so there's a few f things to take away. First thing, I have a way for figuring out what, what's, the probab what, what's the probability of each of these scenarios. And then once I have the probability of each of the scenarios, I just sum over them to calculate the probability of generating each sequence. So the first thing is I just have a way of figuring out what's the probab a, a Bayesian way, a probabilistic way of figuring out what's the probability of each of these sequences. The second thing is if you don't care about that, if you care about more details, is that I do it in a probabilistic way. I don't say there's one winner, I sum over all of them. And the third one is it's consistent with the known biology. So at the end of the day, if I ask what are the statistics of the probabilities of generating all of these sequences, this is what they look like. So I ask how many sequences do I have in my sample that have a probability to be generated that's 10 to the minus 10. I put a cross, 10 to the minus 12 and so on. I make a probability density of the probability of generating these sequences. And this is what it looks like. So the first thing is it scans 20 orders of magnitude. So there are some sequences that are relatively easy to be generated. And why do I say that something that has 10 to the minus 5 probability, which is still a low number, why do I say it's easy? Well, we remember we generate at least 10 to the 9th of them. So these ones that have a probability 10 to the minus 5 are really likely to be generated in all of us. And then the ones that have a probability that's 10 to the minus 25, they have a much lower probability. And if you, and what, so, so that's one thing, it scans a lot. The second thing is what's the red? The red is the variance or the standard deviation coming from about a thousand different people. So basically there is no standard deviation. 
So that's why I'm so confident that if you hand me that piece of paper that you never wrote, I could tell you what's the probability that you generated that DNA sequence as a T cell result. And if you're interested, there's a web app that does that. It's called SOS, so if you Google SOS ENS, you can now stop listening to me for the rest of the talk, but play the game. It works on your phone. Okay, but that's the, that's the general thing. It basically means this is a really universal process. Okay, it's a stochastic process. It's a fully stochastic process. These are probability distributions. However, in all of us, we all have the same probability to generate a given sequence. So what are we? We're really random receptor generators. We have exactly the same machinery. We have like the same die that we roll. But of course, since it's a stochastic process, we generate different realizations of this stochastic process. And for this reason, we're all likely to generate these ones that are, sorry, these ones that are here, but we're less likely to generate the ones that are here. So it's thanks to these that we find the murderer, because these ones are gonna be private and only generated in each one of us, and these ones we're gonna share with everybody else. That's the idea. But from now on, you can think about yourself as a random receptor generator. And you're walking around with this realization that protects you against pathogens. Okay, so in that vein, we now have, we, I know what's the probability of generating a new receptor. I won't tell you how, but it's a similar learning process that we can learn about the selection processes that happen later. So in the end, I know exactly the probability um, of seeing a given receptor in your blood. So I can compare that probability by ob observation, but I can basically compare and I, I can calculate the expectation, what's the probability that you and I share receptor? Since we're in independent random receptor generators, that's just the square of the probabilities of it happening in each one of us. And so then I can ask well, how many receptors are shared between n people, two people, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people. And I can compare data in blue to the model prediction. And you can see that it degrees perfectly. So I can predict how many receptors, although it's a super complicated stochastic process, I can co predict how many receptors we're going to share. And it turns out that it doesn't matter how much soy milk we drink, where we come from, or what we do. We share as much receptors as this biochemical process tells us at the level of unique receptors because we share the common ones. Okay, so at this point, you may be worried about the worldwide population. So, well, you may be worried about the worldwide population in general for other reasons. So there I cannot reassure you, but I can at this, for this point. If we take the 10 billion people that are on the planet right now, we could ask, have we exhausted the possibility? Have we generated every possible receptor there is to generate, that this process can generate? And the answer is no. If we count the different T cell receptors, so we only add new ones to our list, we see that at the 10 billion people, the curve doesn't saturate, it doesn't plateau. It keeps on going at the same rate. So each new person adds a completely new receptor, a set of completely new receptors from that 10 to the minus 25 part of the distribution. So at least in that part, humanity is fine. And thanks to this, we can identify the murderer, even if we had to test everybody in the world. Okay. So yeah, I can skip this. So the other thing, since we tested our conference participants, it turned out that they had COVID, and um, or at least two of them, Pat and Terry. And so we ended up in our the well-known scenario from the last couple of years. Uh, but these being, again, very sure of themselves scientists, they said, well, when we go and we test, you know, we figure out whether we had COVID, what they look for, what they do is an antibody test. And antibodies are B cells and not T cells. So how can you tell us they had COVID by looking at T cells? So it turns out you can. And uh, I'll show you that and tell you a little bit more of a story. So 
our two protagonists, Terry and Pat, before going to this conference where the Joe got murdered, uh, they went to a skiing conference, so also something that you should be intimately familiar with from your own experiences. And of course, going to a skiing conference in February of 2019 was like asking for it to get COVID. So they got COVID. And, okay. Um, so they got COVID and they quarantined and then we collected data from them, well our collaborators collected data from them and s at days 15 through to 85 after the onset of symptoms, they sorted out the T cells and they sequenced them. So you should know that Terry and Pat didn't really suffer too much. They had a low grade fever, loss of smell, but nothing really serious. They were not hospitalized. And you should also know that Terry and Pat uh, uh, participated in another study. So we had data from them from year minus one and minus two before COVID hit the face of the planet. So we're going to use that in a second. Okay, but for now, for now, So for now, we just have this data. So this is what it looks like. So now we're going to look at the frequency, the abundance of each of these, uh, of the different T cells in the body as a function of the days after the infection. And this is what it looks like, okay? It looks like an absolute mess. What you'd like to see is you'd like to see a peak somewhere of T cells responding to an infection. But you see something that you really can't make sense of. So the first thing we did is we did PCA on trajectories and we've identified clusters. We identified three clusters, the purple cluster, the nothing happens cluster, the, the frequencies of these don't change as a function of time, the green cluster, which is what we expected with a peak at day 15 after the infection, and then a secondary cluster at day 37, which we still don't completely understand, but other people have seen it since then. Okay, but since the data looked like this, doing this didn't really inspire confidence in us. So to, to sort of bring that home a little bit, you also see these two X's up there. And what that means is we had the replicates. So we had two samples from the same person at the same time. So this is data from Terry on day 15 uh, from one sample and the other sample. And this is the abundance. This is the number of T cells of a given type. So each dot here is uh, that, that specific T cell in one sample and in another sample. So this is the immunological definition of a diagonal. Okay, this is the same data just separated in two. And you see that in you, it's, the data is so noisy that in some cases you have one cell in one sample and a hundred cells in the other sample. So it's really very noisy. So that's why we're very you know, squeamish about uh, analyzing this. And we also know where this noise comes from because of course there's experimental noise, but there's sampling noise, right? I mean, you sample, you don't, you know, you don't, you're not a complete vampire. You don't get all of the blood out of this person. So sampling noise is Poisson noise, but we also know that what we're looking here is we're sequencing mRNA. mRNA is the step in between DNA and protein. And when mRNA is produced, it's produced in bursts. It's an intermittent process. Okay, nothing happens and bam. Nothing happens and bam. So uh, basically we know that the noise model for mRNA production has long tails. So we, you, we put in a negative binomial as the noise mode. And we also know, and I'll show you later if I have time, that the underlying distribution of the frequencies of these abundances is a power law. So this is the truth, the underlying distribution. This is what we see in the experiments. So you can see that it's got basically accumulated through sampling, this intermittent process starting from a power law. So that's what we put into our noise model and we use the same time replicates 
uh, to learn the parameters of the model. And once we've done that, once we've calibrated the noise model, we can use that as a basis for the probabilistic inference of response. Okay, and so what is response? We basically say that the frequency at a later day is the frequency of an, at an earlier day time sum expansion, which we model as an exponential process. We know that not all clones expand, so we have a fraction of non-expanding and a fraction of expanding. And then we use the posterior distribution to identify expanded clones. And we get the same trends we had before. This is the green contracting. This is the secondary at, with a peak at day 37, but I've added the time points at the year minus one and minus two to show you that this really is an expansion uh, at day 15. So we see this large expansion, and what does it correspond to? So what we're going to look into now is a special subset of T cells. After an expansion, after an infection, the cells that took part in killing the, the pathogen. Some of them get the T cells that basically took part in the infection in quenching the infection. Some of them get set aside and given a special flag, which molecularly is a receptor, which says basically you took part in an infection. It's like getting a medal after you've gone to war kind of thing. And then they have their own meetings, their own nonlinear dynamics and all that. And this is called the memory repertoire. So uh, when we look, so let's just con concentrate at this contracting peak. Uh, when we look only in the memory repertoire, we see the stable memory cells after the infection. So these people basically have long-lived immunity after the infection. But more interestingly, there's also memory cells that recognize COVID before the infection. Okay, I'm only talking about memory cells now that, rec that we, we take the ones that we identify as responding to COVID and we see that they're, they're in the memory pool after, but we also see that they're in the memory pool before. So these people had immunity against COVID before COVID ever hit planet Earth, at least humans, okay? And if we look into more detail, uh, I won't go into what all of the, these are different kinds of memory cells, but the interesting thing here is that they also had long-lived memory cells after the infection, meaning that, you know, you do have some immunity from T cells a long time after the infection. So, okay, so they had pre-existing immunity uh, that corresponds to this response, but all we did is we showed these cells responded. We didn't show they responded to COVID, okay? Maybe um, Pat and Terry, they got some sort of, you know, they, they, they ate something bad or they got an allergy or they got the cold. You know, how do we know that this is linked to, to COVID? So luckily Pat participated in another study 20 days after the infection uh, where they did, went on a molecular fishing expedition. So they basically took a SARS-CoV-2 protein, stuck it on a molecular fishing rod, it's called the tetramer, and then they pulled out all the Pat's T cells that ba would bind, so recognized this SARS-CoV-2 protein. And then, so we had that list, and then we could look in our data set whether we see them at other time points. And that's what this trend is, this blue curve is basically reproducing the, the it, it reproduces the trend we saw with a peak at 15. And what that means is the green ones here are the ones that we found independently by our method. So we're basically able to get most of the high frequency responding uh, SARS-CoV to T, re responsive uh, SARS-CoV to T cells. So we are getting SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells, and we're getting more than with this experiment because here they only stick in one SARS-CoV-2 protein, whereas when you get a real response, you're responding against different proteins coming from the virus. So we're getting more than them, but the ones that are consistent with them are the same. So this gives us confidence we're talking about SARS-CoV-2 and not uh, old cheese. Okay, so. Pushing with that, there was another uh, 
large scale fishing experiment that was done, uh, this time by Hal and Robbins's lab, where they took many SARS-CoV-2 proteins, put them on many fishing rods and stuck them into the blood of many people and pulled out the responding T cells. So we took all of the responding T cells they found, mixed them with our responding T cells and built similarity networks. So we basically put links between T cells that differed by at most one amino acids. And thanks to the fact that they stuck in many different fishing rods with many different SARS-CoV-2 proteins here, we now know what these clusters correspond to because we know what the green ones actually respond to, what SARS-CoV-2 protein they respond to. So this is what it looks like. I won't talk about it in detail. I'll just focus on the pink one, which is PATS, what's called an immunodominant epitope, it means that 21% of all of PADS T cells responded to this one SARS-CoV-2 protein. So let's look at it. This is what it looks like. And T cells that responded to this SARS-CoV-2 protein were already in PADS repertoire a year before the infection. So PAD already had immunity against this SARS-CoV-2 protein before SARS-CoV was there. But one point mutation from this protein gives you the common cold. Okay, and there's a phenomena called cross-reactivity, which is like little Gaussians around the receptor, that a receptor can recognize not just what it's specific for, but some stuff in its environment. So Pat probably got the common cold, developed immunity against that, and that helped Pat deal with SARS-CoV-2 when it arrived. I'll maybe skip this. So going back to the fact that I showed you that we can predict uh, how many receptors are shared between any number of people, we can do it. This is the same thing I showed you for T cells. This is for B cells. But it turns out that if we do it for people who, for B cells and people who recently had SARS-CoV-2, we can't do it. So people who recently had SARS-CoV-2 share many more recept B cell receptors than anybody else. So what COVID does is it focuses your repertoire. It gets rid of the diversity. And not all infections do that. In fact, any other infection we've looked at doesn't do this. So this is interesting. Okay, and just to finish, uh, the other thing we can do with these kinds of things, this is the sort of same thing I showed you about building a noise model. Uh, so this is in blue, the replicates, the frequencies in one sample versus the sam another sample. We can also look at longer time scales and learn something about the natural dynamics of repertoires. So by taking data from people a year and two years apart, which is what this red data is, uh, and comparing it to the expectation of a control, we can learn what is the natural dynamics of repertoires when in principle nothing happens. Because as I said, it's a stochastic distributed system. Even when nothing happens, it doesn't mean everything doesn't move, that there's no dynamics. There is random dynamics. So before that, I talked about response dynamics, so perturbation dynamics. That's what SARS-CoV-2 is. That's what COVID is. It perturbs your system. It forces a strong response. But now I want to talk about the sort of stable, you know, just fluctuations. So what happens there? Well, if we look at the clonal abundances, basically these T cells divide and they die. So uh, for each type of clone, I can go, I can basically divide this equation by C, rewrite it as D log C, and uh, write down the dynamics, the mean dynamics, which I denote by one over tau, which is the net mean decay rate, and then the noise. And I'll show you that this kind of description with uncorrelated noise is the right one. So it seems very simple, especially since we're coming from something much more complicated. If we think about all the details of the model, well, there's cell death, but 
there's some basal growth rate, some basal division rate, but there's also division stimulated by these antigens. So even as I said, when nothing happens, we're probably protecting ourselves constantly about against not maybe very dangerous things, but there's maybe some little proliferation events and so on. So there's some decay of antigens that, or pathogens that infect us, which then stimulate growth of these cells, and there's this sort of complicated dynamics. And on top of that, uh, there's a constant introduction of new T cells, so new clones, from this generative process we already talked about. That happens all throughout your life. So if we simulate this process, we see that uh, the clone size Basically, clones can shoot up and go down very quickly. It's evolutionary dynamics. They always die at the end, but before that, there's stuff like that. And if we collapse this into a cumulative distribution of clone sizes, we get a power law distribution, which is what we see in the data. So how, do we, how can we describe this? Well, what we're going to say is that instead of worrying about all these details, we're going to say that the clone size is described by a mean fitness, so mean growth rate, which is deterministic, which has to be negative because clones on average die, and uh, fitness fluctuations around this mean. And the fitness fluctuations are driven by the environment, which depends on some properties of the pathogens and some other variability. And it turns out that, uh, well, and again, if you still simulate this, you get a power law, so we're good. And then we further make an approximation that the environment autocorrelation is much fast, is much slower uh, than all the other time scales. And in this case, Basically, this noise in the environment can be forgotten and, um, uh, and we decorrelate it and we come up with an uncorrelated environment. And as this shows, this still works and gives us the kind of distributions we want. So we, sorry, it, it's really, it, the, the time scale is faster so we have an uncorrelated environment. And so in general, this equation, of course, doesn't have a solution, but remember that we have this constant introduction of novelty, which actually gives us a steady state solution in terms of a power law that we can solve analytically, and we can characterize this power law in terms of the deterministic net decay rate and the noise. And it turns out, so what this shows is that basically the tails in these distributions are independent of the microscopic noise properties and the temporal correlations in the environment as long as they exist. And we need variable environments, fast varying environments to get these kinds of distributions that we observe in this data. So then we can actually compare with data. So this is the frequency distribution from different people of different ages. And we see that we get this exponent, we get these power laws over many decades, over four decades with exponent one. And then we can perform the same kind of inference or similar inference that I showed you before with the noise model and then learning this kind of dynamics to learn the parameters, the noise parameter, and the turnover parameter, and we see that they all independently, so we don't learn it from this, we actually learn it from the dynamics, but they all fall on this curve defined by uh, this alpha one parameter. So this relation, although this turnover in some people is much slower than in others, they all fall on the same curve. And just to finish, so what does the turnover look like as a function of age? Well, it strongly depends on age, and as you get older, your turnover gets slower. So you basically, your immune system slows down, and, uh, and we have time scales for this. But if you're around 20, then you can be sure that by the time you're 40, you're going to have a pretty nearly complete turnover. By the time you're 40, by the time you're 60, you can still count on a serious turnover. By the time you're 60, you'll probably have a lot of T cells that survive for a long time. Okay, so I'm done. Probably the most important thing I want to tell you is don't kill anyone, even if you have an identical twin. 
And the second most important thing is even if the system is very stochastic, you can still learn the rules and you can make predictions. So thank you. <laughs>